the role of lawyers and data science professionals both is very important to you uh, and the kind of consultancy that you are offering absolutely the lawyers uh, uh, compliance people and the data science people are all critical to the uh, process so we need the lawyers to interpret the uh, the legislation and um, the EU AI act or if it's guidelines from the United States uh, in different areas we need the lawyers to interpret that uh, and then work with the data scientists to understand uh, the intersection of both of those uh, and then work with the client and understand exactly what their goals and objectives are for example for that chatbot and, uh, and lay that foundation down. So it's bringing all of those teams uh, uh, together uh, and having one intersection that is focused from our point of view on responsible AI. Hello and welcome everyone to the next episode of the A Media House podcast, Simulated Reality. Today we are with co-founder and CEO of OrcaWise, Kevin Neary. Hello, Kevin, how are you doing today? Hey, Kashyap, how are you? Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you for making the time and join. Uh, Kevin, when we first spoke, uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, your company and we were also discussing how passionate you are about the subject of responsible AI. I have been uh, studying the AI, so I, I was a data scientist, but then have been studying the AI data science space for the last you know, seven or seven, eight years. And the dialogue around responsible AI has evolved every year. So it's always relevant. So very good that you chose this topic. Uh, at the same time, you also wanted to discuss specifically bias in it, right? Uh, yeah. But before we dive into uh, this thing, can you just introduce uh, yourself to our audience? Tell us a little bit about you and, you know, Orca Wise and the, the work you've been doing. Yes, absolutely. And um... The, um, I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder at OrcaWise, and um, as you pointed out, we are a responsible AI uh, and advisory services firm, and um, we work with clients, uh, mid-sector and enterprises, uh, helping them ensure that their uh, AI systems are responsible. Um, we are a university spin-out from uh, University College Dublin in 2016. Uh, we started off as being AI for marketing and then we progressed into responsible AI because we identified that there was a, a big market coming down the line for responsible AI systems. Uh, so right now we are a, a team of uh, over, over 60 uh, data scientists and uh, legal and compliance professionals all working together uh, to help our clients um, have responsible AI. Uh, we operate across the United States and in Europe, and we're very much aligned around the EU AI Act and helping companies be compliant with the EU AI Act. Uh, and that also involves bringing in legislations from other countries like the US, obviously, and there's a lot of guidelines in the US. Uh, even though there's not a lot of legislation in the US, the guidelines are there, the legislation is in Europe, and we find a lot of our work is around helping companies to navigate uh, both jurisdictions and um, try and have systems that are um, responsible. Yeah. A little bit, to, just to dive deeper into it, right? What does consulting for responsible AI mean? Uh, I have I have done my fair share of research and I have identified what some of the other companies do, right? So I've seen that some uh, have created standards, right? So they standardize or they give a stamp of approval in terms of the uh, uh, an algorithm. Uh, etc. At the same time, I have also seen some companies kind of just consult in terms of legal advice, right? What is your team's, well, let's say you get a client, right? Let's say it's a client in banking and they want to build a chatbot to, which is very customer facing. Uh, do you usually uh, do consultancy or is there some kind of uh, approval process like is this coming as kind of standard approvals that you hand out or what is the exact nature of what your company does when it comes to ensuring responsible ai also uh, to add to that do you usually uh, work at a company level or is it like an application level so in the sense that are you looking at responsibility for an ai uh, built within it or the overall uh, AI systems and the overall organizations. 
Um, yeah, great, great, great question. So initially we started out as an AI consultancy developing um, AI applications, uh, generative AI applications, and then we shifted to uh, responsible AI. Uh, so our focus now is around responsible AI. So somebody else might be delivering the, uh, the generative AI application, um, but we come along and we say, well, okay, company, you need to ensure that you are uh, responsible and ethical and transparent with an application that you're building or maybe somebody else is building it for you. So we work at that layer whereby we help the companies think about uh, responsible AI uh, first uh, so that they lay a solid foundation uh, around responsible AI. And the driving force behind that is legislation uh, and primarily the EU AI Act, uh, which is applicable to US firms and European firms. Uh, and really what we're looking at here is ensuring that um, high risk systems are compliant uh, with the EU AI Act. So if a bank, uh, for example, is working on a, on a chatbot and the chatbot is um, interfacing perhaps with uh, sensitive data, private data, uh, if a chatbot was uh, endeavoring to to uh, interface with uh, human emotions, for example, that's highly risk. It's a high risk system, and therefore, uh, the um, the the application needs to be built with responsible AI in mind. So, in order to do that, we need to work with uh, lawyers and work with data scientists. I'm not a data scientist. I'm a, I'm a business person, so I'm very much at the intersection of the data science and the business. And the business, in this case, from our point of view, is legal and compliance professionals. And of course, in, in the example you're providing, uh, it's the banking operation as well. So it's bringing all those three entities together and setting up a solid foundation to ensure that whatever is developed uh, is responsible and is compliant with the uh, various legislations that might apply to that. So basically, it's the, the role of lawyers and data science professionals both is very important to you uh, and the, the kind of consultancy that you are offering. Absolutely. The lawyers, uh, uh, compliance people and the data science people are all critical to the uh, process. So we need the lawyers to interpret the, uh, the legislation and um, the EU AI Act or if it's guidelines from the United States uh, in different areas, we need the lawyers to interpret that uh, and then work with the data scientists to understand uh, the intersection of both of those uh, and then work with the client and understand exactly what their goals and objectives are, for example, for that chatbot. And, uh, and lay that foundation down. So it's bringing all of those teams uh, uh, together uh, and having one intersection that is focused from our point of view on responsible AI. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you so much for laying the context of what you are doing. And I would like to move on to some of some practical examples while addressing some questions uh, to talk about bias in responsibility. Responsible AI is a broader uh, uh, topic, right? There is a lot of things that come into it. There is ethics, there is uh, fairness, accountability, transparency, explainability, and so many other elements that make it uh, into, you know, uh, that, that fall under the purview of responsibility. Yeah? But we, we wanted to touch upon the subject of bias because that is the most critical, especially in applications which are high risk, right? Uh, I yeah. want to talk also the the subject at hand is bias addressing bias in 2024 right and that is that 2024 is very critical because now we have been into the gen ai buzz for a while and you know there is a lot of evolution can you help me understand how the role of your data scientists and your lawyers evolved from 2020 to 2024 when helping companies address bias as an issue in responsible considering that a lot of applications or AI models were static at that point in time. And over a period of time, we have gone to dynamic training where, you know, whatever the inputs are, the models are trained again on those. And, you know, you are continuously evolving the model. Uh, how do you address bias in such a case? How do you consult with your clients to help them make sure that they are addressing this issue at the very from the very beginning? Yeah, very. It's a, it's it's a very interesting topic, and you are right. Um, things have evolved um, incredibly over the last uh, four years, and um, and it's all about creating awareness amongst the clients uh, around the whole area of bias. Um, and let's uh, 
explorer bias uh, is, is, is a topic I've become fascinated with. Um, and if we think about bias, first of all, from a human point of view, we have what we call human bias. We all have biases in us. It turns out there are around 188 different cognitive biases that can sneak into our thoughts every day as humans. So with odds like that, it's no surprise that AI systems can pick up a bad habit or two. Uh, and if we think of AI as a living thing, we know it learns and changes over time, which means new biases can emerge after a system is deployed. Now, while human bias uh, is part of our nature, and it's important because our biases, they help keep us safe, they keep us happy, uh, it, they're a good thing really, but AI bias is a different story altogether because AI bias can scale across millions of decisions affecting fairness, equality, trust. Uh, and as you know, these biases can lead to unintended consequences. Uh, they impact society on a large scale. They impact organizations, financial services, healthcare. They have a huge impact. And um, it's, it's an important question that you ask. So uh, in terms of engaging with uh, clients, we bring, um, we bring this example of human bias and we ask them to reflect and ask the question uh, do they understand how easy it is for bias to seep into uh, AI, AI applications and that's how we get the conversation started and how how is that journey from static to dynamic models been right the job of your lawyers and data scientists must have evolved a lot i want to understand that evolution a little bit there were some models which are very static in the sense that they were trained on some sort of data, right? And then over a period of time, you addressed the biases in them, technologically as well as legally, right? Or socially as well in some cases. But yeah. with the advent of dynamic systems, right? And we have reinforcement learnings and a lot of uh, models coming up, which are new in nature that are kind of evolving at such a rapid pace as we speak, how do you kind of help your clients address biases in those how, in both aspects? If you can tell me technically as well as uh, you know legally, absolutely. And um, yeah, d detecting bias at the development stage is, is one thing, uh, but then we got to move on to continuously monitor and correct the biases uh, as they seep into the systems, as we identify them and find them. Um, with our clients, we um, we put forward a number of steps that they should consider and that we would support them with. Um, first one I'd mention is continuous monitoring. Um, feedback loops uh, is another technique. Uh, of course, real-time uh, data analysis is important when it comes to uh, bias. And, um, and most importantly is to have a very strong and advanced uh, data strategy. Um, if we look at the first one I mentioned there, uh, continuous monitoring, um, and think of this, just imagine that you're checking your GPS regularly throughout the day to make sure you're on the right path, on the right road. Well, in the same way, we need to constantly check AI systems to detect bias early and correct them before they do any harm. Um, another example uh, that I was working on recently in the hiring industry uh, in a financial services company and uh, the AI system started, started favoring certain resumes over others uh, and by implementing a simple automated continuous monitoring uh, system uh, we enabled to catch that bias early and then start to uh, fix it. Um, I think um, Feedback loops is really important. Uh, I talk a lot about the human in the loop, uh, uh, automated feedbacks, human feedback loops. Uh, and you can think about this uh, in a GPS way as well. Think about your GPS recalculating when you make a wrong turn. So feedback from real world users helps AI adjust and fix biases, uh, especially those that aren't obvious in training data, but show up during actual use. Uh, and that evolution you talk about from 20 to 24, uh, you know, old training data has probably picked up a lot of bias uh, and that needs to be highlighted now as we move forward. Um, I mentioned real-time data analysis, um, which is, I think of it like checking the weather forecast throughout the day, and not just in the morning. Uh, and I'm in Ireland right now where it rains all the time, so I'm checking all the time. Uh, but that always reminds me, uh, our AI systems need to be checked that way as well, constantly. Um, 
spotting bias patterns uh, is is how we think about it. Uh, a lot of organizations think about spotting um, isolated uh, pieces of bias or, uh, or simple anomalies, but really we need to be looking for patterns, uh, especially in high stakes industry like financial services and uh, healthcare is another sector that we look at very closely. Um, and then the data strategy that we mentioned. Um, data strategy is critically important here. And this is like having a balanced diet with regular checkups. Training AI on diverse data reduces bias and the regular audits ensure the system stays aligned with the ethical standards. Uh, so this style of dynamic bias detection uh, this continuous monitoring and using different steps and different techniques in order to continuously monitor uh, is really important. I often think of it like, uh, you know, doing everything possible to make sure your GPS does not send you into a lake. Uh, we have to keep AI on the right path. Got it. And now moving on to as we move towards more dynamic models, obviously, there's, there's no conversation around AI today without talking generative AI. <laughs> I know there is a fatigue around the subject, but we have to address uh, the biases in generative AI, right? Uh, you just talk uh, talked about some of the ways that we move from static models to dynamic models, how there is continuous monitoring uh, through human in the loop as well as through technology in itself. Is it different when it comes to Gen AI, especially considering that a lot of its uh, data is built on massive uncurated data sets across the internet where they are scarring huge amounts of uh, data, APIs, websites, etc., to kind of deliver something. Um, what is what is your team doing differently when it comes to detecting bias in generative AI applications? Yeah, it's um, uh, it is an important uh, distinction that you make, um, and it's important to look at generative AI uh, separately from AI um, in a broader sense, um, because uh, I don't think a lot of people, a lot of organizations, are not fully aware of how. Uh, uh, how much bias can creep into generative AI. And you mentioned there uh, the internet. Uh, and if you think about uh, uh, generative AI uh, and think about AI, how AI works, AI mimics the quirks of the data it's trained on, the biases and all. Uh, Gen AI is, can be like a friend who's desperate to impress you. Uh, you know, for example, you like pineapple on pizza, and so does your AI. You think cats are better than dogs, well, so does your AI. Uh, and the problem with Gen AI doesn't stop there. It scales these biases, uh, sometimes broadcasting them from the virtual rooftops. Uh, and this becomes especially concerning when JI mo Gen AI models uh, are working with uh, text and images that are trained on massive uncurated data sets from the internet, uh, to your point. Uh, and it's like they're on an endless binge of online trends, absorbing both the best and the worst and of everything that's out there. Uh, and from my discussion with uh, business leaders, I found that organizations are starting to tackle this issue in, uh, in creative ways. Mm -hmm. If you want to look at some of those creative ways that I've come across, um, the curating quality training data is very important here. Uh, so think of curating training data like uh, putting your AI on a healthy diet. If you feed it junk food, you can't expect it to be a health guru. Uh, carefully selecting high quality, diverse data teaches AI to see the world in a more balanced way, uh, therefore reducing bias. Um, for instance, I got first-hand experience of this problem when I was prompting one of the large language models for details about AI legislation in the US and in Europe. And the responses I was getting from the, uh, uh, the model were very general. They were useful, but very general. Uh, but they were not nuanced enough for something as important as ensuring compliance with the EU AI Act. Uh, and that led me to look at this problem. And we thought about building a more focused model with uh, curated data relevant to the data that we had to invest in. Uh, so what we did was we built a system of data curation with lawyers. Um, we're creating 25,000 questions and answered pairs. 
And this is our curated data created by humans. And we're using that to train a custom model on top of one of the frontier models. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting great results from that. It's time consuming, it's a big investment. And, um, but the quality of the outputs coming from that are amazing. One of the things uh, that you mentioned about uh, the previous in the previous question uh, were two things. One is uh, human intervention, and second is with regards to the uh, monitoring aspects of it. Right now, yeah. overall, considering algorithmic auditing, right? Uh, how effective are the current auditing frameworks when it comes to some of the things that you mentioned? Right. What are some of the evolutions that are needed? I think it also you answered this question partly in the previous uh, in the previous answer. Uh, but can we dive a little deeper uh, into these things, right? When we when we mentioned that we are building systems that are trying to track biases, can we take an example for everything? And what is it that exact a generative AI example? And what is it exactly that we are tracking? Because bias can sometimes be subjective as well right so for example if you're making a decision on hiring someone uh, and there is a there is a discrepancy in terms of hiring for males and females which has happened in the past you know i think you know the example that i'm talking about yeah uh, but there there might be some conditions where it's actually not showing bias or you know there might be actually a reason as to why that algorithmic decision making is uh, justified in that case. So my question to you is: In this evolving and dynamic world of uh, evolving, uh, in this evolving world of dynamic AI, how do you do algorithmic audits? And what are your frameworks that you said? Taking an example, if you can help our audience understand a little bit more better, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, one thing just before moving on to the algorithmic uh, frameworks, um, which you highlight has been really important, and I agree, is, is to have um, diverse teams um, in place inside your organization, because a lot of these biases originate with um, uh, with humans and uh, over time and our, our practices. And so I would always uh, encourage organizations to look at the team very carefully. And most com companies are uh, very interested in diversity and uh, inclusivity uh, and that's a great opportunity to uh, improve the um, the um, the AI team from a bias detection point of view and from a development point of view um, you are right there's a lot of uh, talk around uh, algorithmic auditing and building frameworks uh, and the importance of this cannot be uh, overstated and these systems, they ensure that AI remains fair, transparent, accurate, accountable, like you said. Um, and these audits are becoming more common. Uh, and one thing that's driving these audits is the amount of legislation and guidelines that are out there. Um, you can correct and uh, set out a, a whole range of challenges around correcting uh, bias with these audits. Um, but the auditing frameworks they we have now often only focus on technical aspects like uh, data quality, model performance, uh, the accuracy of algorithms. Uh, and of course, all of those are crucial, but they don't always catch the more nuanced biases uh, related to social and ethical concerns. Um, another issue we see a lot of, uh, particularly in large organizations, is the effectiveness of the audits that are being run, because the effectiveness of these audits heavily depends on the quality of the auditors and the tools they use. So if you don't have the right experts or bias detection tools in place, these audits might not fully address the deeper societal issues that may be embedded in AI systems. And I think we're moving to an era where these uh, social and ethical um, issues and characteristics are becoming more and more important. Uh, and I see a lot of tools uh, in the early stages being developed to, uh, to, to, to get this piece right. Uh, so generally, we need to raise the bar uh, by incorporating some ethical and social impact assessments uh, into these frameworks. These are uh, assessments specifically uh, tapping into ethical issues and social issues. Um, and this would allow us to catch biases that traditional technical audits might miss. Uh, I think in the future, it will be vital for organizations to have uh, more robust processes 
uh, that assess both technical performance and the wider social uh, impact of their AI systems. Um, I noticed a, as well in the market um, that there are tools coming out now. Um, some of these tools have been around for a while in academic settings inside universities, and they're creeping into industry slowly. Uh, explainability tools like uh, Lime and Shap, which are fairly well known, um, these help auditors understand why an AI model makes certain decisions, uh, providing that much needed transparency. Uh, and, and, and certain bias detection algorithms are becoming more advanced, uh, allowing us to identify hidden biases that were previously um, hard to, to get at. Uh, now, of course, as I mentioned, uh, the biggest driver of change is, is regulatory standards. And um, this is why we decided to go into responsible AI and, uh, and bias, uh, because uh, standards like the EU AI Act and the uh, proposed uh, legislation in the US, there is the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which is coming down the line. And these regulations are starting to um, ask for uh, AI audits as a requirement. And this is what's pushing companies and driving companies to maintain fairness and transparency uh, in their AI systems. Uh, I also noticed in recent times we're seeing organizations like uh, the IEEE emphasize ethical guidelines uh, mm. requiring independent audits to ensure AI systems don't just work, but that they work responsibly. And we're moving towards this societal impact, uh, which is becoming more and more popular. To add to that point, right, you also mentioned assessment for social issues. I really want to give our audience an example. Can you give it an example of how you evolved? to monitoring just basic uh, outputs of a model to kind of assessing social issues and how to, how to navigate that entire problem statement because social values are very different in different uh, geographies and different uh, you know ethnicities religions etc so how do you kind of navigate help us with an example right that would be really in terms of the social issues um it's important to look at how people uh, think about um things in different societies and it's the um a, a point we talk about a lot is the intersection of um uh, of characteristics of individuals. Uh, we often uh, talk about um, uh, race or culture or uh, sex, gender, uh, when we're talking about AI bias. But really, we're looking at the intersection of uh, some of these characteristics, and uh, that's very important. And that goes uh, some way toward um, identifying uh, what social issues uh, might uh, impact a certain community, for example. Uh, so when we're thinking about, uh, you know, in, 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 in one uh, jurisdiction, uh, perhaps we're concerned about, um, about gender uh, and bias. But really, if we look at another community, we might be uh, more interested in uh, gender and uh, uh, income uh, and uh, other background issues that might be need to be taken into account. Uh, and working through these uh, is um, very, very complex. Um, I um, currently uh, have a project running in a research institution whereby we're looking at this issue and uh, trying to figure out uh, a way to move forward with it. Um, when I started researching it, we did not have an example of um, a, a real life industry situation that we could follow. So uh, we thought we'd move this to research we, um, ourselves. We are a research um, backed organization. We came out of research. So uh, anytime we encounter something new, we go for uh, a research uh, approach. Um, so I, do, I, I, I don't believe that we have a lot of work done on this uh, in the market right now, Cash Up. I think this is something that we got to embrace. And, and move forward um, and very quickly. Got it. Now let's move on to a little different topic, right? Uh, let's talk about, uh, while we, we were talking about the assessment side of it, which comes at the end, right? We are trying to monitor it through the outputs that are given. I want to talk about the inputs to these AI models, and especially in the 2024 context where synthetic data has become a big conversation. Yeah, th with this is very, a very fascinating for me because this conversation has multiple layers. It's actually not just about input because synthetic data is in itself an output of some uh, previous 
uh, yeah. you know model that we have done. Yeah. Now the previous model, which output this synthetic data to kind of create different instances, uh, I have seen that you know that they have built different kinds of tools to ensure that synthetic data has a variety of distribution across different answers in terms of the input that goes uh, to the newer model, right? My question to you is, what, how has this impacted your uh, conversation around bias, the, the the generation of synthetic data? What are some of the benefits of using synthetic data to reduce bias? What are some of its limitations in addressing um, the same problem? Absolutely, and it's a good, very good point the way you put it. It's, it's an input and it's an output at the same time. Um, and synthetic data, uh, by definition, it's like creating a virtual twin of a of real world data. Uh, it looks and acts like the real thing, but does con doesn't contain any identifiable information. Uh, and this synthetic data, it's increasingly being used to mitigate bias in AI models by uh, filling gaps in data sets that lack uh, diversity. And for example, in a real world data set doesn't represent certain ethnic groups, uh, the synthetic data can step in and help ensure that the AI systems remain inclusive. Um, an example in healthcare, synthetic data can be used to ensure that facial recognition systems accurately identify people of all skin tones uh, and therefore uh, reduce racial bias. And this approach, uh, ensures that patients are treated fairly regardless of their uh, background. Um, I think another benefit of it is in the uh, world of data privacy and privacy protection. Since synthetic data doesn't include any personal information, it minimizes the risk of privacy breaches, uh, which makes it safer to use while still providing uh, a realistic uh, training data. So I think um, it has it has benefits and uh, it is a powerful tool if you don't have enough data to train your models, uh, but you do need to have uh, a system in place so that you are not building bias on top of bias, which is the biggest risk with uh, synthetic data. Um, it isn't without uh, other flaws as well. I think if uh, algorithmic generating uh, synthetic data is biased, it can introduce a, a, and even maintain uh, a whole range of biases that weren't present uh, in the original data set. So it, ca it can take on a new life and not just continue simple biases that it had. It can actually uh, start generating a whole new uh, 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 pathway of, uh, of biases um, and reinforce um, uh, previous prejudices. The way to deal with this problem, um, I think developers need to ensure that they are using unbiased, well-designed algorithms uh, for generating the synthetic data. Um, I think additionally comparing synthetic data to real-world outcomes is essential uh, to get these discrepancies. And again, regular audits and human oversight are critically important uh, to make sure synthetic data aligns with ethical standards. Um, and the more I look at this uh, uh, bias problem, the more I see the importance of the human oversight uh, working with the tools. Of course, we need the frameworks, we need the strategy, we need uh, uh, we need we, we, you know we need applications to work on. Uh, but the human in the loop is everywhere when it comes to uh, bias. Uh, you mentioned earlier financial institution um, they use synthetic data a fair bit. Uh, it's pretty handy around stuff like uh, assessing credit worthiness. Uh, and now by making sure the synthetic data includes a diverse range of say financial profiles of a particular financial organization, running bias uh, tests on them. Uh, an institution can ensure the AI model doesn't unfairly score certain groups. Um, and this kind of uh, thorough review process uh, that synthetic data serves its purpose, creating fairer AI systems. Um, the idea and the purpose, as you pointed out quite rightly, Cash Up, is to make sure we don't introduce new issues. Uh, and that's the key point around synthetic data. Okay. Uh, and my uh, final, well, semi final question to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. so is with regards to the uh, intersectional bias, right? So we have, we have touched upon different aspects of it, but nowadays uh, there was a lot of discussion around, let's say, some of the tools that were built. Let's say, let, let's talk about the recidivism uh, tool that was built, you know, which uh, which was being used, uh, where 
the data set or some of the work that Joy Bolomini has done in her this thing in her face recognition technology that she identified that certain traces were detected less accurately than uh, the other races, right? Uh, the solution to that obviously is that you know you have uh, not the only solution, but one of the one of the areas where it needs working is that you have a larger data set of all uh, that represents the ecosystem really well especially in in today's context where there is a lot of ai being built which is general purpose let's say even chat gpt for that matter right or some of the other tools that are coming up every almost online platform tool be it social media or be it anything else has an ai tool which is embedded into it considering the vast array of users right how do you how do these companies address intersectional bias uh, what are some of the methodologies uh, what are some of the considerations apart from uh, data gathering right or ensuring there is good data representation through synthetic data or otherwise what are some of the steps that these companies need to take and have at the back of their mind yeah, absolutely. And this goes back to your earlier question around the societal uh, thing and how to how to get at that. And I think uh, intersectional data is going to be one uh, of the um, uh, topics that will support uh, us uh, dealing with societal issues as we go forward. Um, companies typically uh, look at this um, uh, in a two or three step process. Uh, I noticed that uh, intersectional data, uh, which is a, a, a multifaceted identities of individuals. So uh, it's really important to have intersectional data um, that we can use to consider all of the factors. Um, so uh, when we talk about intersectional data, we're talking about how uh, we can have an overlap on different criteria like uh, race and uh, social and geography, all of these things coming into play at once. And um, it's important to have a strategy that basically it deals with intersectional data uh, and, and, and to work with that, as you mentioned, uh, um, uh, in a, a synthetic data context in order to get that right. Uh, another approach I, I see out there is uh, intersectional critical algorithms, and um, uh, I've been researching this recently, and this is a new technique uh, for me, uh, where these algorithms are designed to go uh, beyond surface level categories and consider the combined effects of different identity uh, factors. So in this case, we're simulating what might happen if we have uh, all of these uh, intersectional characteristics uh, coming together. Um, I've also come across uh, talk of advanced ethical AI practices, uh, like, uh, for example, fairness aware machine learning um, are making strides in addressing these biases. Uh, we see a trend amongst companies uh, and particularly research researchers right now developing fairness auditing tools uh, that can test decision making processes, ensuring uh, they don't disproportionately harm uh, these marginalized uh, communities. Um, and it, it, it brings us back to the, your earlier point around uh, social and uh, I think uh, uh, and the human in the loop uh, with that uh, and collaboration uh, between technologists and social scientists is crucial here. Um, engaging in communities that are already affected by intersectional bias uh, that can help AI developers learn from these experiences uh, and build more inclusive systems. So I strongly believe that by involving uh, these communities and, and tapping into these uh, societal uh, nuances um, and then working that into our data, we can ensure that the AI benefits everybody uh, in the long term. Fantastic. And now to my final question, uh, you know, with throughout this conversation, right, one of the themes that you maintained strongly was the human in the loop, right? you always believe that there should be human oversight while there are algorithms tracking the outputs of these AI models to detect bias. Human intervention is very critical, but it's very, uh, how do you say this? So basically AI is always was always made to kind of reduce human intervention, right? Uh, it was always to kind of automate tasks intelligently and to make its maximum benefit. Uh, it is very, very critical. 
well not critical but at the same time it is it is important to reduce human intervention let's take the example of self driving cars right right now tesla is you know giving uh, cars where you know you, ha- you you have to put your hands on steering it's ai will do most of the jobs but just in case there is any you know uh, glitch it you know human intervention is necessary but at the same time uh, there are, there is waymo and zooks in in san francisco city which are running completely by its own there is no human intervention do you believe that bias as a problem statement can be solved uh, completely ever or there should always be human intervention at some point um yeah so this this whole question around um the human intervention it, it's one of my favorite approaches to bias right now um and i don't see beyond that right now um the the idea of automating everything around bias uh, seems fairly um way out um in the future for me um certainly we can have thresholds uh, when it comes to automation so we can look at a, a a predictive algorithm for example and think about that maybe in the healthcare industry predicting patients health and uh, and look at a, a a prediction scenario that can deliver 80% plus um you know, positive results every time um, but if we look at that the other way and it's always under 80% uh, well then we've got a threshold there there whereby we need to always have um, human intervention so having these this threshold system is obviously very important and uh, that's across uh, all industries um so i um don't come across very many examples uh where ai can take care of everything uh, and i don't, certainly don't come across any examples where bias can be um, uh, totally uh, detected uh, mitigated and planned for uh, without a human in the loop and really on this piece around uh, human intervention it's it's about finding the right balance uh, between the human oversight and the ai driven uh, decision making um i mentioned before in orcawise the firm i lead um uh, we found that collaborative development to be key uh, having lawyers work closely with data scientists during a training phase um of the eu ai act custom model that we're developing uh, and our teams are responsible for re- re- reviewing the training data and outputs to ensure legal and ethical considerations are included uh we we run regular feedback sessions uh to allow for real time identification of biases uh and that all keeps the project moving forward uh, slowly and it uh, doesn't um um sorry it doesn't slow down uh, innovation it, it keeps the project moving moving forward uh, i think that um situation is often uh, mentioned to me that we are slowing down innovation but in truth if we run into a roadblock because we've automated everything and we got to go back and start all over again that's going to be a bigger uh, detriment to our projects uh, so the human in the loop um is to to twofold it 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 it, it helps manage uh, the bias situation and it also helps ensure projects do move forward and sometimes at a steady pace not as quickly as you might want and um but at least you're getting uh, the human in the loop and you're you're certain that of the outputs that are coming down the line are what you want um explainable ai is also crucial and um going back to the tools and explainable ai tools are very much uh user friendly um they're pretty easy uh, for um humans to work with them um I, 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 IBM have really some nice tools in this area uh, AIX is a very good tool um and they 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 understand why models make certain decisions and um, and they help the users uh, you know understand uh, uh, how to spot and correct biases uh, in certain kinds of uh, data so um i think some of the best practices in this area um is clear oversight and again we're back to the human um we've just started started an ai ethics committee uh, in our company uh, and in that we have business leaders we have uh, legal experts data scientists who review the outputs um uh, and look at the ethical implications uh, regularly uh, and all of this helps ensure we balance innovation uh, with uh, compliance um i mentioned the uh, decision thresholds and i think almost everything i look at uh, in this area uh, has 
decision thresholds front and center. Um, how far can we go uh, with automation? Uh, what is the cutoff point? Um, uh, and certainly in, 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 in critical systems like health, uh, finance, uh, education, um, even government now, government is, is moving towards AI and a lot of decision making goes on in government organizations. And um, I think decision threshold, thresholds is going to be um, extremely important so that we understand the complexity uh, of the cases that we're working on and understand very clearly which cases need to be automated um, in, a, in a secure way with no concerns and then which ones are risky and therefore humans must be uh, totally involved. On that note, thank you so much, Kevin, for making the time. It was a wonderful conversation. I know we decided to have a short conversation, but I believe that you know to do justice to the topic, uh, we have to kind of discuss all the elements. I, I'm sure that you know everybody will find it inter interesting. Your insights were, uh, your insights were really insightful. <laughs> yeah, we're very good, nicely put, uh, Kashyap, and uh, great talking to you. You, you asked great questions, and uh, uh, you kept a, a very good conversation going. Thank you.